I'm very honored and very happy to be here. It's not my first time in Wroclaw. The first time I arrived here, it was in 2014, on the occasion of the workshop on modern ideology. And then uh, I came here, it was in 2015, on the occasion of the Critical Legal Conference 2015, which was uh, a very important event, um, both for the critical legal community and uh, I think also for, for the legal community in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it is precisely at that time that uh, on the occasion of the plenary session I, I presented here, so you know, it is really the, 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 the right place for, for, uh, for presenting you the book, I think, because uh, I presented um, some sort of, uh, of prolegomena, if you want, of uh, what I wanted to do in this, in this book, because at that time, I was just thinking that, you know, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to write a book about um, the status of legality uh, under communism, which, you know, has been something which has been bugging me all for, for a, bugging me for, for, a, for a long time now. Uh, and it's something on which I reflected, I tried to reflect at least quite a lot starting my, my, uh, my PhD years. Um, and then this uh, fed in quite a lot in, in, uh, in other projects. Um, so, seriously, I'm very happy to be here and I, I thank you a lot for it. And then, once again, I want to, I want to underline that the, the importance of what is happening at, uh, at this center, at the Center of, um, uh, for uh, Legal Education and Social Theory, which uh, it is probably one of the institutions which is quite unique in the, in the region. Um, and uh, you know everyone here is, is doing an excellent an excellent work, and also, also that I would like to thank to, to the faculty, faculty of law at the University of Wroclaw, um, because hosting this sort of events it, it's crucial for for the development of legal scholarship, which is nowadays, and especially for legal theory, which nowadays I, I really think that it's it finds itself under various forms of threat. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so let's take a look a bit about what this, I mean, let's take a look at what this book is about. So I try to, to, to focus, keeping in mind that it is for you, this presentation, and it's less about me. Um, I try to focus on three concepts, which I find key for understanding or, you know, for deciphering the whole problematic that the book raises or, you know, tries to explore. Um, so law, Revolution exception. Yeah. The title of the book is Towards the Jurisprudence of State Communism. Now that there are many things that the book tries to cover, but the most probably the, the basic thing that, that I would like you know to, to, to keep you know probably in your mind is, is the fact that it is really about the status of legality during that period of time that started somewhere in 1945 in Central and Eastern Europe, you know, it might have started perhaps earlier in, in some parts of, of, of our region. And we imagine that it ended at least, you know, around 1989. So, you know, one of the, the first things that can change to, uh, one of the first things that, that, that I had in my mind when I started the research, my PhD research at, uh, it was in 2007, it was basically in 2006 at the, uh, uh, at, uh, at the Sorbonne in Paris. It was, well, what was that period, legally speaking? What was this about? What was the status of law? So if you look around that time, and you know, ever since, you have seen many attempts, and probably you've heard quite a lot in the public opinion, in the media, in what you have been taught, in what you have, you know, in, in his, uh, reading history books, reading perhaps even, you know, books of constitutional law, books of legal theory, you know, that basically that period was in a way or another a legal vacuum. Yeah. It was a void. Yeah. See the void here in this page, you know, like this part, you know, it was a period in which, you know, basically there was nothing which happened, yeah. So, I mean, I just give you some examples. So, from my, my own experience, as a, when I was a, a student of law at the, the faculty uh, of law in Bucharest, um, and you would take a book of legal history at that time, uh, and you start reading, and you know, basically everything ended around 
1938, just went up until that point. And, you know, that was it. That was legal history. It stopped. From that point on, there was no, nothing interesting to her. Because, you know, obviously there were questions related to dictatorship, authoritarianism, perhaps totalitarianism, and so on and so forth. So basically, there was something which was of no interest to the lawyers. But, you know, I mean, something that you can live with, you know, there are people who can live personally very easily with this, but I, I was, you know, I was perplexed in a sense because around that time when I was writing my PhD, uh, my, my PhD thesis, there was a um, um, commission for the analysis of the communist dictatorship in Romania, who uttered, and everything it's, it's in the book, who uttered something along these lines. Um, we are concluding that um, the legal system of the country was that, was that of a country without a legal system. Which, I mean, it is really, in a way, perplexing if you're thinking about it. I mean, how can the legal system be the legal system of a country without a legal system? Yeah? I mean, the, both cannot be true at the same time. Yeah? And then this raises a question of a, of a very basic administrative law question. Yeah? What is the status of the birth certificate issued under a legal system which doesn't have a legal system? <laughs> or, to put it you know, in, a, in, in better terms, you know, what is the status of a birth certificate or any sort of certificate issued by a legal, by a legal authority under a regime which is considered to be deprived of law? So, I myself, well, maybe this is not very productive. I mean, all, all the stuff that had, was written uh, about that period of time, and it was written precisely by people who are working in what we call the trans transitional justice. Do you know what transitional justice is about? Yeah. So basically, it is all the sort of mechanisms through which you come to deal with a violent past. So. Other things that were written by people who are specific uh, specialists in what we call memory studies. Yeah. So what happened during that period from, from, from the perspective of experienced history. Other things which were written by historians at that time. So I, told myself, I wasn't very satisfied about, by these answers because you know, most of them, they lacked what I would call you know, a jurisprudential insight into things. And they lacked precisely that particular view that the legal theorist can bring. So that they weren't able really to, to deal with, uh, with this issue of law under communism. No. Um, so what does this bring us? Well, my first step that I thought of, you know, look, perhaps this is true, yeah. this part here, this point, it, it is true. Perhaps that nothing happened, legally speaking, during that period of time. Perhaps, you know, all that period we should just forget because nothing happened. There was no law there. But then again, what was the law before that void? Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, look, let's, let's take a look at what was the law before that void. That moment of, you know, rupture in the structure of the law. Yeah. So now I think we can do it. So basically what we can, you know, most of the, most of historians would argue, and most of, you know, legal historians, legal theorists, they would say that basically everyone would agree that before dictatorships, either right-wing dictatorships, but especially communist dictatorships came into place, there was a legal system yeah, in our country. Yeah, there was a legal system. But those legal systems, they functioned, or they, they were articulated, or they, could, they were to be thought under this particular view, I mean, this view which was, and it's still work, a workable, I mean, it, it is still something which, which we can use today, which was articulated by this theorist, Hans Kelsen. Are you familiar with the name? No. I mean, Hans Kelsen, he, he really is, if you want, like the theorist, 
which has articulated probably our, even if, you know, we are all Gersenians in Central and Eastern Europe, even if we, we, we if, even if we don't know his name, we're still Gersenians. Because basically, what he says, he started writing his works at the, just before World War I, yeah? So around 1913, 1914, around that time. Uh, but he properly articulated his theory around 1930s. And he published this book, the first edition of the Theory of Law, in 1934. Yeah. So, why am I saying that he is, you know, the representative of, of continental jurisprudence? So even if we're dreaming and sleeping and, you know, thinking about the law at any moment in time, we are transcendent. Because he um, just thinks that law, it's only about norms. It's not about something else. But it's not, I mean, these norms, they are very different from any other forms of norms. Yeah? The legal norms, they are very different from religious norms, they are very different from so so norms of social conduct, they are very different from any. They have something which is specific to them. And what it is really specific to them, it is given by what we call the principle of imputation. So the principle of imputation makes one able to see that there is a relation, let's call it hierarchical, a relation between two norms. Yeah? And this hierarchical relation between two, two norms, if you apply it, you can read the whole reality like a system of norms. Just let me give you an example. So basically, you know, in physics, in biology, in chemistry, and so on. We have the natural world, if you want. We have the principle of causation. Yeah? If something hits a ball, the ball is going to move. And it is precisely because something hit that ball. Yeah? The ball is going to move. In um, the normative system, in the legal normative system, something exists, all the material acts, have a legal meaning and a legal significance because of the principle of imputation, because we know that they are coming from the, from the right legally organized authority. Yeah. Yeah. So we know that the law is a law because it was passed by the parliament. And we know because it was passed by the parliament because the parliament was uh, rightly constituted in accordance to the constitution, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So you can go to the Constitution, you can get them. And the funny thing is that you can go as far as you want. Yeah? Up until the moment when you're going to, to stop at some point in time. You're going to stop at some point in time because, you know, historically you can't make any meaning out of it. I mean, you can go, and then you're going to realize something which is very funny. You're going to realize that basically the whole system of norms exists because there is this specific normativity which exists. Now, philosophically, this is not very clear, what he says. It is not very clear because it is not a very simple transcendental argument that he's proposing, or because he doesn't stop here. He falls short in saying something very strange. Because, I mean, everything would be fine if you want to have a pure theory of law which is not a valid law. Yeah. So we can imagine that if you want to have a theory of law, um, or a theory of norms just like that. But what can you do if you want to make the distinction between you know, a constitution that either me or Wojtek wrote, and they keep it on, on the computer, we keep it on the computer. Yeah. What is the difference between this and the value constitution? And Kelsen tells us that, you know, still validity, it is a function of the relation with reality. Yeah. Now, you see what it's written there. The validity of a legal system governing the behavior of particular human beings depends in a certain way on the fact that the real behavior corresponds to the legal system. And it depends in a certain way on the efficacy of the system. So basically, you can only have law, valid law, as long as society functions according to that law. 
But is this a very helpful theory in this sense? And you know, keep this in mind. Is this really a very helpful theory? Because if you're going to say that, you know, all law is valid law because there is something happening out there in society, and we don't really know what it is, perhaps, you know, theoretically, you are not answering to the question of what not. Yeah. And this is something which is very, it's not what I want to, to what I want to, to, to let you know about it, it is not only that it is a question of philosophy, if you want, it is also a very important political question. Because if you're not able to say, or to give any sort of, sort of normative um, content about how the society should be, anything can be that. Yeah? Anything can be that. And that was written in 1934. Yeah. At the time when Kelson had to leave all his position in Germany, and he had to move to Switzerland, and then, you know, he moved for a while in Prague. So it was embedded in the history of Central and Eastern Europe as well, all of that. And we can think a bit, you can think a bit more about it. Yeah. Now, this was part of what we can call the law before communism. Yeah? This is one part of it. The other part is this guy, Karl Schmidt. Yeah. Karl Schmidt, who was also a German theorist, I mean, Hans Kielsen, he was Austrian. Um, he was German, but they were part of, if you want, of the same community of scholars of that time. He wrote, in 1921, a book which was called Political Theology. In this book, he deals with one thing that Kelsen wasn't able to address fully, because, you know, you saw that he stopped at that moment. He just said, you know, look, law has, has to have some relation to society, but we don't really, he doesn't want to talk about that particular relation to society. Whereas Schmidt, he just says, look, it is all about that relation to society. And that relation to society, it is given by a decision. Because, you know, everything can be fun and it can work well and we don't have any problem in terms, in legal terms, if you want. Up until things are going out of hand. And the things are going out of hand, like they did in Germany around 1921, because the moment when he wrote that book, the country was experiencing a, a revolutionary mo um, moment. Uh, and he says that what's happening at this moment of when someone relates, wants to relate the, the law to reality, what we have, the norm in itself is destroyed in this exception. So in such a situation, it's clear that the state remains while the law, law recedes. What's happening in this, you know, what is this question of exception? The question of exception is, it, you can understand it quite simply. Um, do you, have you ever heard about what martial law is? Martial law? Yeah. Yeah? So martial, in martial law situations, basically the constitutional guarantees are suspended just in order for the constitution in itself, if you want, has to be, uh, just in order for, for the Constitution to be protected. Yeah. So, in order to protect the existence of the Constitution, we are going to suspend your right to a, to a fair trial, for instance. Or we are going to suspend your right to privacy. You have military censorship. Someone is going to, to, to read your emails. Just because, you know, there is a threat somewhere. Yeah. Might be terrorists, you know, something. Now, for Carl Schmitt, this is really the core of the legal system. Even if the norm is receding, even if the legal norms are, you know, sort of disappearing to the point of, you know, in which they have, they are rendered meaningless. This is all, this is legality. Legality and sovereign, and sovereign command, they are really entangled one to another. Yeah. Now, 
What do you think about this regime of legality? This is the regime of legality that, you know, most of us were looking at and were saying this is, you know, the regime of legality which existed before that void brought by the communists. Yeah? I mean, you know, it is not that articulated, you know, legality that we imagine it to be. Because basically what we had during that period of time, coming from the World War I, in most of the countries, and I'm not only speaking, I, I can, can give you the example of Romania. Basically, Romania was a country in which the state of siege, that is Karschmidt, basically, uh, was in which the state of siege or the state of exception was in force all the time. I mean, there are only five years in which, you know, on the, uh, you know, on the territory of the capital of Romania, it wasn't used. But it was used all the time. During all that time, it was used on some parts of the territory. So, you know, basically we're talking about, you know, an existence sort of an, an imagined legality which was never articulated. It was never fully articulated. At the time when, 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 when Hans Kessel was writing those things about legality, you know, 1934, in Germany, you know, we already had the, the Nuremberg decrees, which were basically doing the same thing that, that Karl Schmitt was saying. They were suspending the, uh, the constitutional protections. So, stop here for the time. This is legality, if you want, before communism. So I have to, to, to think it through in the, in the sense, I mean, my, my idea was constantly, you know, we have to think it through because, you know, if we want to understand what was happening during that void, we need to have a, an idea about what was before it. Yeah. So we're moving a bit. And now we're moving further, and we're moving further this time, we're moving 100 years before. Yeah. And we're sort of changing a bit of the, of the landscape. We're going to ask ourselves, you know, look, if law and legality were about this, what was, you know, the revolution about? Yeah, because communists, when they took power, they pretended that they are revolutionaries. And they are revolutionaries not of a national type, but of, and not of a specific, you know, liberal type, but they were revolutionary of a Marxist type. Because most of them, they thought that they were revolutionaries supporting the ideas of Karl Marx and Engels, yeah? I mean, we can debate it whether they really did this in reality or not, but, I mean, everyone at that time would agree that they were some sort of, you know, that they presented themselves as being Marxists. Whether they were truly Marxist or not, that's another question. But, you know, 1945, or let's say 1944, when the Soviet tanks come in Romania, and on them you also had, you know, parts of the Central Committee of the Romanian Communist Party, you ask the people from the Romanian Communist Party, are you a Marxist? They are going to tell, well, I'm a Stalinist. Um, but then, still they would say, yes, we believe in the teachings of Marx and Lenin. I mean, for sure. Now, what are these ideas about, and what was the theory, if we can call it theory? What was the, their view, or the original view, on law? Yeah. I mean, what were these people, what was the, the revolution about? Yeah. One of their ideas was that, look, we need to dismantle the legal systems. And we need to dis dismantle legal systems and states, because the law is not something neutral. The law is not something which is inscribed in nature. The law is not something which is transcendent and universal, but it is really the rule of a definite, of a definite class of, of society whose social power derived from its property has its practical idealistic expression, in each case in the form of the state. So it is not about, it is about who has the power. And one particular form 
of power. Yeah. It's economic power, which for Marxists, this is, it's the most important. Because everything, it is based on economics. This is the structure of reality. This is what structures reality. Yeah. Now, there is a long thread of movement, if you want, because you know the German ideology is a book which was written before the, the revolution of 1848. Yeah, so it's really what, almost 100 years before what we discussed before. And then you have another definition of the revolution, if you want, in terms of, in this terms, in, in, in the work of Karl Marx in the preface of the contribution to the critique of political economy. So you can take a look at this, yeah. Uh, which basically would say that because there is a rupture or a, a constant antagonism, if you want, between the means of production and the uh, relations of production, one day, yeah, the means of production meaning all the material that we have, yeah, all the, the inanimate material forces that, that, that are in society. I mean, you know, we can think about computers nowadays, yeah? And when they are going to develop too much, at some point in time, they are going to render the relations of production, and the relations of production is the organization of society, yeah? With all its forms. They are going to render them obsolete. And when they are going to be obsolete, they are going to hamper the development of the, meaning of, pro of the means of production. And there is only one way out, revolution. Yeah? And this is what they said. Revolution would be basically a form of, it, it is a historical necessity, it just happens. Yeah. It just happens because of the, the development of the means of production, because you know people read, invent, and so on and so forth, and then this produces changes. Now, you can discuss a bit we can, we can discuss a lot about you know, how these changes are produced, whether they should go into one direction or another, and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not going to tell you all about this, and I don't want to get into this. But what I wanted to, to say, to, to tell, uh, what I wanted to, uh, to underline here is the fact that for Marx the, and, 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 and Engels at the origins, um, their position about the law was very much related to their view on economy. So basically the law, it was a reflection of what exists in the, in the economy. And the revolution was related to changing this part. Yeah. Now, this is not very easy because you have to understand you know, how does law operate, where it, is, where it is its place. Is it simply the fact that the law is an illusion, which is that, that, that means an ideological superstructure. Yeah. What about property law? Because if it is an illusion, what do we do with private law, which tells you that basically property, it's, it takes the form of individual property. Yeah. So if it is mere, a mere illusion, which doesn't have any sort of bearing on reality, how are you going to understand what this reality is? So perhaps, you know, law is a bit weird, because it might operate somewhere at the, at the interface between the relations of production and ideology. You can look at the law as being part of the economic structure in itself. Yeah? Because you don't, if you don't know what property means, how are you going to organize your life? Yeah? Do, do you grasp this? So it's, it's not a mere you know, kind of element of the superstructure. Uh, superstructure is not only a mere illusion. Now, we move on from this. So, <coughs> what we had so far, we understood a bit, you know, what was this idea of revolution about? Dealing away with the law. Yeah. But what are, how do you deal away with the law? How do you get rid of it? Can you really get rid of it? And it's something we could discuss a bit more later on. Yeah. Can you really get, get rid of it? Now, 
In history, there were some moments. So I told you already about 1848. 1848, in February, you have the, what it is called the bourgeois liberal revolution. In June, you have the first communist revolution, which was quelled by the liberal government of that time. Guess how? Legally. Do you have an idea how it was quelled? By using the state of exception. Yeah. They brought in the army. It was Gen uh, General Dizot in Paris. They brought in the army, shot everyone, in order to protect the Constitution. 1871, before that moment, you had the first communist revolution which sort of succeeds. It's not communist in itself. It can be considered anarchist, it can be considered what, what you want. It's in Paris, it's what they call the Paris Commune. And it was the first time when it succeeds in the sense that they take power. So then you have a, comi a committee, which was called the Comité de Salut, de Salut Public, so the Committee for, for the Public um, Safety, uh, which takes power. And they take power and they institute some form of you know, organization of Paris. Now the question would be, you know, what is that? And it is for the first time that you know the concept emerges. It is that of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Marx writes, wrote about it at, at, uh, at the outcome of, of, of the revolution, which was failed. The troops from Versailles came in, they quelled the revolution and so on. But it was this idea, what is going to, you know, the, the, what is the dictatorship of the proletariat? Because the dictatorship of the proletariat, if you're looking at it, it's a very strange formula. It is a dictatorship. Um, a dictatorship, if you're looking at it in, properly, in its proper legal meaning, means one thing, which is also related to the state of exception. It means that one person or one body takes the power, and it exercises that power in order to impose an order. Yeah. You had examples of this in the whole history of, you know, of the Western cultures. Yeah. So you had examples like this back in the days of Roman law. Uh, you had examples like this in 1848, and then in, in 1789, and you had examples like this in 1848. Yeah. And now, you're in 1871, and you had this sort of first idea. Now, we're moving to another revolution, revolution of 1917, where you're going to have you know, the first revolution which is going to succeed. But before that time, you have this person there, which you might have heard the name, Lenin. Yeah. And he writes about the fact that we can't get rid of the law just like that. Basically, you take power, this doesn't mean that the law is going to disappear. Yeah? He just says that, you know, we must not think that having overthrown capitalism, people will at once learn to work for society without any rules of law. Besides, the abolition of capitalism does not immediately create the economic prerequisites for such a change. Now, this is a bit... It is interesting because, you know, he's looking at the, this concept of dictatorship of the proletariat as a very uh, particularly limited temporarily period of time. In which he says, and he brings in this idea, that basically for a long, for a period of time, the state is going to continue to exist. The law is going to continue to exist. Everything is going to, you know, you're going to have a legal order, but that order is going to be the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the law is going to disappear. After that, what you're going to have, you're going to have what is the formula was, and we can get back, we can get back a bit to, yes, the formula of Karl Marx of, and Engels was that the law is going to wither away. So the law is going to simply disappear. Because basically, the law is related to these things. It is a reflection of these things, of the relations of production. So basically, if you're going to change the relation of, of production, and you're going to change the, the modes of production, 
It's going to disappear. At that moment in time, it's going to disappear. Now, you can think of whatever what you want about this disappearance in itself, whether it's possible and so on and so forth. But it is worth to keep in mind that, you know, at the very beginning, and now we can get back to, to this, the idea was that law is going to disappear. Yeah? And we end up with the following thing. In between, so that was the idea of the revolution. That is, in short, the idea of a revolutionary takeover. You're going to have a revolutionary takeover in which basically the law is going to disappear at the end of it. And there is no, no and you know, you can take it in, in a sense that there's not going to be use of lawyers. Yeah. There's not going to be, you know, there were times when at the beginning of, I mean, 1920s in Russia, they, they started, you know, to close uh, law schools because they didn't really know what is going to happen, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's not going to be a need for lawyers. And then this, all of this, uh, this part is going to, to enable us to, to discuss a bit more about what law is. Why law is supposed to be said, what law is about. Um, and then there is another Marxist theorist that I'm not quoting here, and his name is Evgeny Pashukhanis, who was also, he would say, even a bit more than, than the fact that the law is going to disappear. He's going to say that as, as long, this is probably the most important bit that I want to underline with my book, as long as there's going to be law, the revolution didn't succeed. It's not that. Didn't achieve its goals. So, we get back, we arrive to some point in time in 1935, 1936, and then we are in Soviet Russia at that time. And after we had the first five year, five year plan, have a constitution, which is called the Constitution of the Soviet uh, uh, of the United uh, of the Union of uh, the Soviet Republics. And that, together with that, so you have this, which was supported by by Stalin. There were, you know, many changes of uh, of actors, of political actors, and political forces in Russia at that time, and so on. But within this context, you have the emergence of a new idea. But basically, it was done. There is the revolution achieved its goals. The revolution should stop. It stops because it achieved all its goals. Um, but then, you know, surprise, the law, this is the surprise. The law and the state, they survive because the proletariat requires the state, the state apparatus, and the definite state of the socialist legal law. So, now we can think a bit more about what this, does this mean. You know, the fact that, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, you know, it is a, a distinction about it, it is really, a, it is about eight years distance. That you're moving from this idea that one day the law is going to disappear, to the, to the idea that, you know, the proletariat state needs the law. And from this moment on, the book moves into another direction in which you know, it starts, tries to, to show, or you know, it tries to, to explore phenomenologically how this happened in the example of Romania and with some examples from, from, uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to insist on that part. Uh, but what I wanted you to, to, you know, to, to go home with and you know, to take from, from, from this book is really you know, this sort of relation between law, revolution, and exception. You know, the fact that, for instance, you know, on one hand, the, the law was considered as a form which represents the interest of one particular class. And then, all of a sudden, you're getting back from where we began. 
But in 1936, in Stalinist Russia, we are going to say that basically law is a necessity. So, if this is true, we can get back to the first page, the very, very, very first page. This one. If this is true, how come this part here is a void? And, you know, one of the parts that I'm, go that I'm describing and, you know, analyzing a, a bit in more detail, basically what you have here is law. This, does, this means that, you know, that part of our history and experience was lawful. Lawful means meaning full of law. I mean, there were horrible things happening there. I mean, all the, what we call the Stalinist crimes, they took place not in a legal vacuum, but they took place within legality. Even, you know, parts of, you know, what we call, I mean, even the horrors of World War II took part in a legal space. Now, there are problems with that. And these are, you know, things that I would, you know, like you to think of, and you know, with this, at how we try to think a bit of. Um, how can you still call them if you have a legal system in place and it was off? Yeah. How can you still call something which is happening within a legal system with all the requirements of a legal system? How are you going to be able to call it a crime? How are you going to call it a crime? Maybe, you know, we should probably find out another way of referring to these things. You know, we can call, for instance, you know, when people, when, you know, when someone was taken by, in the case of Romania, by the forces of the Secret Service, Securitate, was taken home, from home in the night and shot somewhere, uh, because he was, a, according to, to admin, well, according to legal regulations, he was an enemy of, of the people or a traitor. Was that a crime? They had, you know, a legal basis for doing this. How do you deal with that? You can call that a legal killing. But this means that basically you are just making a, a, a moral judgment. I mean, you're, you're just... The only thing that you can make is a moral judgment about that. It's not a legal judgment that you can make about that. Uh, now, there are other things about this. Probably something which, you know, it's another level of questions related, uh, raised by, by this, or that I want to, to, to stir up a bit, is that, you know, perhaps, you know, we shouldn't take the law only as being something as a pure neutral tool, as being a pure neutral tool. Uh, maybe the law has, you know, how can we live with this sort of history as lawyers? Can we say that, you know, look, 1999 have the change, the regime change, we have a new constitution in 1991 in Romania and so on, and, you know, everything changed. But just living in a very nice world and so on and so forth. Because basically, you know, those people for about 40 years, they also lived in one of the best worlds according to the legal existence, I mean, you know. Um, now, there are also questions related to one other thing that I'm now I'm going to, 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 to bring on the table even more with you, is, is the question of, you know, what do you do as lawyers? And what do you do as lawyers in the sense of how are you going to oppose? forms of oppression, which are lawful, or how are you going to support, perhaps, I don't know, progressive movements? Can you, as lawyers, be critical? Or, you know, just being lawyer makes you simply one person who just deals with the law as it is, with the positive law. And you know, then you can go home and can sleep calmly and so on. And then there is another issue. What were those people here taught 
What if they thought, in a way or another, that, you know, the requirements of legality are those of preserving society as it is, of preserving the status quo. 1945, well, what do you think in 1950s, what a judge or what a, what a law student was taught? And then, how do you think about that? And then, you know, there is the, the more, you know, question which is probably interesting given more, it is the question of, you know, how are we taught about this sort of things? And this is the question of legal education at the end of the day. And the legal education which takes place in an ideological space, and which takes place within a particular history, and should be aware of that particular history. Uh, because if it is not aware of that particular history and development, um, it can end up by simply repeating the same process. And it's just repeating the same process, and I'm not saying that it's just repeating that bit here, but it's just simply repeating what has been always there. But in a sense that that's good, because you know it kind of comforts us and so on and so forth. Nothing changes and so on and so forth. Nothing had changed since the time of the Roman law. It's good, you know, it is comfortable. But in a way or another, we're going to probably repeat the same thing, constantly repeat. Uh, and you know, what is basically what sort of legal education can you have without having a an idea about you know, what I would like to call like, the, the, the historical embeddedness of law. The fact that law takes place within a history, and it comes up with a sort of a conceptual history that you can't really get rid of. I mean, even those people, they weren't able to get rid of. You know, that moment of rapture that I told you, that sort of void here, never existed. No one got rid of it. I mean, you know, seriously, and one of the points that, that I'm bringing in, you know, in the case of Romania during the, the 1970s, yeah, so it, when it was really the apex of, of, of socialism, we still had a civil code, and which was, surprise, the same civil code as it was in 1864. It was really the same. Well, there were parts of it which were suspended in, in its application, but otherwise the text was the same. Um, so a specific end, if you're thinking of that code, it was basically founded on, on the Napoleonic Code of 1804, which was written this time in Romanian and it was adapted and so on and so forth, but you know, the concepts were very much the same. And if you're thinking of, you know, the concepts of the Code of 1804, they all go back to some very ancient concepts. So if you're just thinking uncritically about the law in these terms, you know, basically repeating the same thing. And that's what we're doing. I mean, you know, as lawyers, we are perhaps forced to do this. Because if we're not doing that, we're no longer lawyers, are we? So, on this note. Thank you.